So the purpose of the field work that I did was to gather data from three urban preschools in Kathmandu. And so the purpose of this is, be, since I'm an educator, is I want, to have, I want teachers to understand specifically the child and cultural context. And so where this stems from is about two years ago, my colleagues and I took 12 students from Wyoming to Kathmandu. And so they taught for three weeks in some various schools. But what happened was, instead of them having these um, epiphanies about the child and cultural context, they kind of left being more ethnocentric. So instead of it promoting cultural relativism, they decided that their American ways were the best ways. And the reason for that was because now they saw the Nepali ways. Do you, know, you guys know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, that really concerned me. So I decided to go back and do some more research. And these are the research questions. And that is, what are pre-service teachers' perception, perceptions of the child and cultural context in Wyoming and Nepal? And then how can video foster understandings about children as cultural beings and teaching as a cultural activity? And again, in that previous slide, one of the assumptions the students had when I took them over to teach children in Nepal was that children are universal, right? That children are the same everywhere. And then one of the questions I would ask them is, I said, well, do you think adults are the same everywhere? And they said, oh, no, because they're affected by culture. I said, well, then when do children become cultural beings? Is it at age four, then they're affected by culture, age six? The literature would say that it's in the womb, right? That children are born in cultural beings in the womb. Um, but students didn't really understand this notion that children, young children in particular, were already affected by culture. So um, I had three phases. And phase one, which is part of my sabbatical research, I went to Kathmandu for a month. And I videotaped three different schools. Um, now, I'm, that was phase one, now I'm in phase two, and my Nepali colleague and I are looking through all of this data. She owns one of the schools that we looked at, and we're trying to figure out what's the best data to show students to have them think about the child and cultural context. So I'm just going to show you one of the provocations that we might show the students um, for this project. So what's interesting here, if you pay attention, this is cleanup after lunch. And you'll notice that the actu actually the children are on the potty here. Those are potty chairs. And there's one bucket, and the teacher is going. And notice, too, that, well, she is changing the water, but there's not, it's not for each child. It's not systematic, right? So it's kind of a group potty routine. And when I show this to students, they get very freaked out, right? Because in the United States, you don't even go in the bathroom with children. I mean, it's very individual, isn't it, right? It's not a community potty. And so, but here is the school in Kathmandu, and this is one of the schools that they'll be teaching at. So, um, and also, do children sit there pretty, pretty well. They play with toys during their potty routine. Again, if you go to an early childhood center in the United States, you don't have toys when you're going to the potty. Like, that's not allowed, right? So this would just be one example of a video provocation that we would share with um, United States students to have them think about what does this mean. And part of why I want to show this is most of them would see this, and then they'd want to tell the Nepali teachers how to fix it. Right? Well, let me tell you how to do it the right way. But what I'm trying to teach them is don't look at this through a deficit model. Let's see, what are this, how does this support this child in this context? What are they learning from this? How is this making them a productive citizen in their culture? Okay, but another thing that I wanted to show my students is, so if I only show them that one school, they have this idea that all schools in Kathmandu look like that, right? So that's their image is 
of a poor school. So I also videotaped very high income schools. And I'll show you some pictures um, between the two. So this is the same school, and this is instruction time. So here's an image of them, which again, they kind of had that colonial system of workbooks, right? Um, there's no, uh, they're not playing with sand or with Play-Doh, which we would do here um, with early childhood students. Here's another image of the classroom, and then here's another one. And what's interesting about this one is these are children that are about four years old. And again, if you went to a school in um, Laramie even, it's very play-based, right? You don't have four-year-olds sitting and listening to a lecture, and that's what's happening here. And then here's the image of the school itself. In contrast, this is the high-income school. So what do we see that's different here? We see small groups of children learning. They're, they have manipulatives that they're working with, right? You can see that um, also this school is English only. So I don't have pictures of that, but if you walk around, um, it says on the walls, English only in this school. So they really catered to um, higher education parents. Most of the parents have, probably have a PhD from this school. Here's another example of what the school looks like. And then more importantly, in contrast to that first picture of the low-income school, this is the high-income school, right? So it almost looks like an office building. Don't you think so? Right, so let's look at the other one. We'll go back. So here's the high income. And then this would be the low income school. So very different. And this was another thing that I wanted students to understand, that you can't generalize. And that's what a lot of our students do, in particular with teachers, that they think that all the schools must look the same. And that's not true. The next steps is to continue to work with the video that we have. We have lot a month's worth of video from these schools, so a lot of data. So my colleague and I are working on that. Um, and then again, we're taking a new group of students to teach in Nepal. So the same schools that I showed, they're going to be teaching there in May. And so I'm using this data to prepare them to think about what do you need to know about these children before you're able to teach them? And how can you look at them um, through a model of strength versus a model of deficit.